So we have seen just before a break one drawback of Cider. It has not, the advantage is that the address can localize, localize you, but when you move from one provider to another, you have to remember. But why also people have found off a NAT in that situation? Because if you are using a NAT for your company, you don't have to remember all your, your network. You just have to change the NAT configuration. For example, here, all your company is running on a private network. You put a NAT here. And when you move from one provider to another provider, then you change, just change the prefixes allocated to your NAT. And this way, you don't have to remember all the equipment. So this is one advantage of, another advantage of NAT is that you have an independence between your numbering plant and things that are seen outside. But the main drawback of CIDR is when you want to be multi-owned. To be multi-owned means that you want to be connected by two providers at the same time. And the idea is that if this provider, this provider fails, then the other will be able to send that. But if we are using CIDR plan, it doesn't work very well. Because here with CIDR, you see, we are using the longest prefix match uh, rules to forward the traffic. It means that here, you inject on the network a prefix which is very small, 16 bits, but on the other side, we inject the prefix which is longer, which is 24 bits long. It means, it means that instead of having several providers, all your traffic will go through the second provider. And that's a little bit uh, strange, because the prefix belongs to provider 1, but in fact, Due to the fact you enable things to provide your B2, a larger prefix, all the traffic will arrive to your site on provider 2. So, it doesn't work well, that's why people introduce a new thing called provider independent addresses. So, in the CIDR plan, you will have two kinds of prefixes. So one will be provider aggregable prefixes, which means that this, pro this follow your hierarchy we have found, and the other one is provider independent prefixes, and in that case, you just, you ask your registries for a prefix, and this prefix will be very long. So it's last 24 or longer. And then you take agreement with your two providers, and your two provider will forward the will forward the announcement on the internet. So this way, the size of the prefix are the same on both ways. So it means that if you are closer to provider one, the traffic will be sent through provider one. If you are closer from provider two. So traffic will be sent to the provider. So here you have a kind of low balance. So, you see that CIDR is a good uh, uh, way to manage prefixes, but it doesn't work uh, all the time. For example, here, I have a map, so we are going to, to see, we can have a look in real time to that map. So if I click here, normally, so if we look, we are about 350,000 entries in the routing table. So if you are a provider and you maintain a global vision of the internet, you will have to memorize for IPv4 350,000 routes. That is given here. And here on the map we have the history. So this history, um, here you have the dates. 
So it started in 1994 because before it was not cider, so not aggregable, but the class address. And then until 1999, we had something that looks very uh, linear in the growth of the routing table. So people were very happy about that. And people that manage the internet say, look, cider is very, very good. Because during this period of time, the growth, the internet doubled every 100 days. So you have an uh, exponential growth of the internet traffic, but you have only a linear growth of the routing table. So that proves that CIDR was very, very efficient. But if we look after 1998 uh, or 99, you see that this growth is no more linear, but looks more exponential. So here, people start to, to fear this problem because if we have a very big growth, it means that router will not be able to memorize all the prefixes. So why, what happens during this period, 1999 to uh, 2001? We can say e-commerce, or you can say the internet bubble. So it means that everybody wanted to be connected to the internet. And for example, you, you wanted to create a company that was selling share on the internet, and so you will see your bank and you say, okay, I want to create a company that sells share because the, uh, the market of share is uh, this billion of dollars every year. So if I take only 1% of this market, I will be very rich, etc., etc. So you have all your business plan to prove that selling share on the internet was something very interesting. But you are also a problem that if your connection to your provider broke, Right? So you will not be able to continue to sell share. If you look with books, you want to buy your books on the internet, so you go to Amazon, Amazon.com to buy your book, and if Amazon.com doesn't answer, you will not wait until Amazon.com recover, but you will go on the site and you will buy your book. So it means that when you are doing e-commerce, it's very important to be multi owned and to have a very good quality for your connection. So that's why a lot of people ask for PI prefixes during that period. And each PI has to be memorized into the routing table. So it means that you have this increase in the routing table. So hopefully, in 2001, the internet bubble exploded, and during one year, we have a lot of companies that disappear. You have also a lot of aggregation that was being done. And then you have to pay to send your PI on the internet. So when you ask for an agreement with your provider, then you have to pay to send this information, your prefix. It's also because it has a cost. You take some memory in all the router in the internet, so you have to pay for, for that. So this reduces the need for PI addresses, and after 2002, the, internet, the routing table size start again to, to rise, but here you see it was linear. And until after this date, we have also a linear. But here, the slope is higher and higher. And here it's not due to PI, it's due to emerging countries. So China, Brazil, and uh, India, that wants to be connected to internet and ask for prefixes. And what we see here is a normal growth of the routing table. And until now, we are about, three, as I said, 350,000 users. So hardware now are able to manage all these rules. So you can forward without any problem packets, even if you have a routing table, a big routing table. And we will see in the rest of the class how we can do in the core network to reduce the size of this routing table as we have seen this morning 
when we are doing bridging, and where we see that bridge in the middle of the network doesn't have to remember all the MAC addresses. Here we can have the same techniques in, uh, in routing in that VIP region. Now, what about prefix delegation? Prefix delegation, has a, we have two rules at the beginning. So before, when we have classes, it was to guarantee uniqueness of address. And that's the most important thing. Because if Internet survived, it was not the best protocol. Or other protocols have better functionalities, but Internet offers you a global connectivity. Even if we have not, we still have some uh, feeling of global connectivity. So that's the most important thing. And in fact, it's represented by a law called the Metcalf Mel Mel Law. Remember, Metcalf, the one that drinks its paper during the conference. He also developed Ethernet and created a law that says that the value of the network is the square of the user. It means that it's very simple to demonstrate this, uh, this law. Is that when you are alone on a network, it's not very useful. You can talk to yourself, but that's not very important. When you have two, you can create one connection. When you are three, you have three kinds of connections. When you are four, you have uh, six kind of connection. When you are five, etc., etc. So it's represented by n factor uh, times n plus one divided by two. So it's a number of possible connection. So this is something that is similar to n squared. So it means that um, that's the interest of the internet network. If you go to internet. Is not because IP is the best protocol. You go to internet because other people are on internet. It's the same thing. If you go to Facebook, it's because other people are on Facebook. It's not because Facebook like Facebook, Facebook or not. It's because the other are. There. And so this is driven by the net culture. It means that more people are somewhere, they attract more people. And only one for the first server, or only one side server. So that's something that so uniqueness and interconnection was the key point of the internet. But we have seen that this addressing was not good, so it was divided in five areas. So just have a look at these registries. So we have Epina, NIC, so Asia Pacific, here. We have LACNIC, Latin America and Caribbean uh, Network Information Center, for uh, Latin and Caribbean, everybody that speaks Spanish, French, or um, Portuguese. And ARIN, for Canadian and US. Europe, you see that. The definition of Europe is uh, bigger than the European community because it includes Russia and the Middle East. And you have Africa for Africa. So if you are a provider running in that district, uh, that area, so you will ask prefixes to one of these registries. So how it works? So you have IANA that manage the first bit, the first byte of the address. And this first byte, slash 8, is allocated to one of the region. Then region will give prefixes to providers, and provider will give them to their customer. So what is interesting to see, and we can have a look to this table, so I go. So here you have a lot of complex computation. I think this one is good. Let me see. Uh, no. So you have a lot of very, very complex computation to prove that 
it's very serious but you don't care about all that what is important to look at is at the end here it's the red line the red line gives you the size of the INA pool so remember if you have the drawing INA gives prefixes to register and the little problem is that since the 1st of, the 1st of February there is no more prefix in the INA pool it means that all the slash 8 has been allocated to to region in, uh, in the world. So now, no registry can ask for more IPv4 prefixes. So I think that now we are just running on the INA, uh, the registry pools. So we don't have, I don't have here the remaining prefixes, the remaining slash A for different districts. And what we see is that APNIC, so Asia Pacific area, has only one slash eight remaining. That means that in one week or two weeks, APNIC will be the first area where provider will not be able to have more IPv4 addresses. So in one or two weeks, this, uh, if you go to Asia, you want to establish, want to be a new provider in Asia, then you will not be able to get it before. <coughs> so that's the problem. Then, if you look at uh, computation, I think that then you will have Europe uh, that will lack of addresses in six months. So let's go on now. So you see that we we have a problem with uh, IPv4. We have no more address. We cannot extend the size of the address because if we extend the size of the address, it's a new protocol. In IPv4, we have 32 bits and we cannot change it. So, in, uh, in 1993, uh, IETF or IAB decide to develop a new protocol. So, I would like to, I don't know why this slide is here, but for me, it's the most important slide to understand the transition between IPv4 and IPv4. So you have to, to put two things, to have two things in mind. One is the packet format, and the other way, the other thing is how you allocate you allocate addresses. So here in 1918, IPv4 was designed. So you saw the RFC, and the packet format didn't change since 1981. In 1993, people start developing a new protocol for IPv6, and the packet format is different. And these, these things are designed to last as long as possible, to be stable in time, because it's a common language between all the equipment. But on the other side, you have the address, how you manage the address. And if you look, in IPv4, in 1993, people changed the way the address was managed. We go from a class full address to CIDR, so a classless addressing class. So it means that we changed totally the way the network was managed, but the packet format remains the same. When we are going to IPv6, we are going to change the packet format but we are not going to change the way the network is managed. It means that we are still use, we are going to use the cyber parallel. Because it's the only way we know how to manage the network. So doing that means that when you will run an IPv6 network, you will not be totally uh, it will not be totally strange for you, because if you know to run an IPv4 network, then you will find the same thing. You will find the same routing protocol, 
you will find the same way to allocate address to equipment. So all things that are related to address management will be almost the same. So we are going to lose compatibility between all equipment, because if we have some equipment that talk only IPv4 and other equipment that talk IPv6, they cannot directly communicate, because they don't have the same packet form. But, so that's the problem. Because if we know the Metcalf to Metcalf flow, what, what you will say? A very nice protocol that scale well, but with nobody on it, or an old protocol with lot of patches, with NAT, with all the, some ugly things, but where all the people are connected. Of course, you will select IPv4. And that's a problem. Because since all the information is on IPv4, it's very difficult to move to IPv6. And that's something that the ITF under-evaluate when they plan the transition between IPv4 and IPv6. In fact, the ITF was saying that we are going to establish IPv6 in parallel with IPv4, and little by little the content will move to IPv6, and when we will have problems with IPv4, everybody will be on IPv6, and IPv4 will be able to disappear. In fact, it doesn't uh, happen like uh, this way. What we have is that people continue to use IPv4 because everything was on IPv4. So if we create a new program, a new application, then this application has to be on IPv4. Because otherwise you will not find the customer. Since you have developed a lot of app to put IPv4 on it, then you don't need IPv6. And that's why IPv6 remains for a long period of time only for academics and crazy people that want to play with it. We'll talk about that when we will see transition. IPv4 will not disappear. For example, in France, we have an old protocol called X25 that was used in the 70s, and we have always some customer that use this protocol. Because it works well, it fills their needs, so they continue to use it. And nowadays, Ross Telecom is trying to push customers away from X25 by increasing the cost of the network, because they want people to go to IP. So it means that if you have something that works in IPv4, you have absolutely no reason to move to IPv6. And if you are a bank, and you want to develop your intranet, you have absolutely no reason to put it in IPv6 because it's too risky. Security is not so well managed in IPv6 as in IPv4. You don't hackers no more than you in IPv6 and in IPv4. So all these things think make that inside your network you can continue to use IPv4. But if you want to to be, to be uh, contacted by the rest of the world. You are in a bank and you create a web service. And all people are able to connect. For example, you can imagine that in Latin America, maybe some country will not have enough IPv4 address and will start to deploy IPv6 on the network. So if you want to have, attract this customer, you will have to be able to develop an IPv6 interface with your customer. So it means that in that case, for a bank, for example, the only thing you have to do is to have your web service, web server in IPv6, your mail in IPv6, but all your intranet can continue to run in IPv4. One day IPv6 will be as good as IPv4 for your company, and so little by little you will move by to IPv6, the strategy for by global stack, because it costs you a lot to have two stacks, to manage two stacks, and it will be more and more difficult to find equipment for the IPv4. It's not the case right now. But that's a scenario. So you don't have to push IPv6 everywhere. You just have to push IPv6 where it's needed. So this is for legacy systems. Now if you look at new, for example, telephony. Telephony using NAT is a nightmare. So it may, it may be easier to run that kind of service in IPv6. 
And if only you don't find all the equipment, nowadays I run into it. But it's just a question of time. So as for new services, in red we will talk about a lot of that. You will have a, a seminar on machine-to-machine uh, uh, -machine communication. And here, all the scenarios include IPv6. Maybe not everywhere. And you will have gateway that allow you to, move, to be in IPv4 in one place, IPv6 in another place. But if you want to deploy, I want to deploy at ETAM a sensor network to see if the light is on when the, there is no class, to manage the temperature of the room, to close the door, to open the door, to have some security uh, feature devices, then this thing will be an IPv6 because you have a configuration. So, this part of the network will be IPv6, other part will be IPv4. So, uh, it, it really depends where you are on the network. If you are a provider, you will have to uh, offer IPv4 and IPv6. If you are in your home, with your IDSL box, then normally your provider should offer you IPv4 and IPv6. But in a bank, Continue to run like this. It's too much trouble. There is now all the tools to manage well like this. So there is not only one answer. But the, what we know is that the future is not IPv4. And the cost to manage IPv4 will be higher and higher. So I don't know if you have looked at uh, uh, some news that Nortel has sent his uh, IPv4 address to Microsoft. And it was, uh, I don't remember, but it was about $11 per address. So it was uh, some million of dollars to get uh, the process. So it means that to, to get an IPv4 connectivity will be more and more expensive. And you are not guaranteed to have the full carrier connectivity. Until now, IPv4 works well, and it was not very expensive to manage. So it was not a problem. But since there is no more prefixes, you will have, if you create a new, a new service, you will need IPv4 address. And it's very difficult to get right now. So you will have to, you can ask some people to buy them or to, but it will be expensive. So here is a plan. So as I said, IPv6 is totally incompatible with IPv4 for content. And that's a big problem due to medical flow. But as a network manager, it's almost the same because it's based in cyber. So what we have right now is that you change your packet format, but you don't change how you manage the network. And the only thing you change is that you have space. In IPv4 now you play with one bit. When you create an addressing scheme, you have to play with some strange net mask to use uh, as many addresses as possible. In IPv6, you will waste addresses. And that's a strange reflex, because for many, many years, we have uh, been used not to waste addresses. And now we can play with a very big space. And that's something a little bit different. So we will see the difference in management, but globally, it's the same. And since we have room, we can invent new way to manage a network. For example, I can put a GPS coordinate in my address. And so I want to send a packet on the highway to say there is an accident at this place. And so I want to tell the cars that are around this accident that they have to stop. So maybe I can use geographical coordinate in my address. How? I don't know. If you want to make research on that, that's a good uh, way. But this way you will increase, you will have a different way to manage the network. And we have enough room in IPv6 address to do that. But that's an open door to the future. Currently we don't have a real way to, to do that. But now we have room to do it. In IPv4 there was no more, there were enough, in, enough room to do that kind of thing. So, we are going to see addresses. So first, uh, when you are 
you what, but generally you do see that. You leave the room and you run away and say, I will never ever to remember this kind of thing. And that's true. This is not IPv6 address. This is just random number. So you cannot memorize random number. So, don't see IPv6 address as random number. They have a structure, and when you know the structure, it's easier to manage IPv6 address than IPv4 address. So, I will, even if you are not convinced right now, I will show you why it's easier to manage IPv6 address. So, if you look at so IPv6, we know it's better than IPv4. So, since it's better, we are going to do things in a better way. For example, instead of using a dot to separate blocks, we are going to use two dots to separate the blocks. So, so it's better. In fact, we use two dots because we can sometimes include an IPv4 address into an IPv6 address. And here we will put dots in the IPv6 in IPv4. We are going to see that later. In IPv4, we separate blocks of 8 bits to make a number. Here, we separate blocks of 16 bits. In IPv4, we represent an address in decimal, which is a real nightmare, because when I have a slash 22, for example, I have to convert things in binary to understand how to. And conversion in binary between decimal and binary is complex. Using hexadecimal is easier because you take, for example, 2 and you write 2 in binary, 0, 0, 1, 0. And so you have the, the value in binary. So that's why we have this address. So it's very long because it's 128 bits long. So four times the size of an IPv4 address. But remember, what I say is that network engineers are very lazy and they will not want to write such things. So what you can do is to compress the notation of the address. So first, all the zeros that are on the left can be removed. And so this way you have this representation. And if you find a sequence of zero, a long sequence of zero inside your address, you can replace it by column to column. Of course, you can do it only once. You cannot have two column columns in your address. Because here I know the length of this part because I know that the whole address is 128 bits. If I put two of this, I don't know the size of these two parts. The loopback address in IPv6 is column to column one. So it means that it's 127 bits equal to 0, and the last bit equal to 1. So here I know, because in here I know that in fact this is 16 bits that are written 0, 0, 0, 1. So I know that this part is 16 bits, so I know that the rest is 0, 0. I don't have to specify the length, because I know that it's 127. So, since I know the size of one, the block before column column, and the size of the block after column column, and that the sum must be 128 bits, I can know how many zeros I have here. So, what I can do also, as I say, is to include an IPv4 address to an IPv4. It's quite easy because in IPv4 it's 72 bit, and here I have 128 bits, so I can put one IPv4 address. Or I can put two IPv4 address. We will see some transition mechanism that allows you to get to have more addresses, more IPv4 address in the address. So that's one possibility. There is only one trick. Be careful when you see this reference. 
When you see 2001 six, uh, 63 Coulomb column 40, 40. So 40 is 4. Uh, so you see that one character here, 2, 0, it's right, it's 4 bits. Okay? So 40 means, means 10 characters. So if I count here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, so 8, it's good. In fact, I have to go back to the representation where I put all the zeros. Like here, I forget this zero here, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then at 9, 10. So 3 is written this way. So when I do a slash 40, in fact, I stop here. And it's 0, 0. If I wanted to represent a 3, then I have to put all the zero before. Okay, and here, if I stop at 10, here I have a 3. So that's the only trick. You may have some problem in every single one if you don't uh, follow this representation. But that's a very small problem. So, of course, I tell you uh, at the beginning of the class that IPv4 was developed with, uh, we had only 100 equipment in uh, 1983. And people say, okay, that's a good justification to have a fixed address size. And it will be 32 bit because we have 4 billion of addresses, and the difference between 4 billion and 100 is so high that we will never reach these 4 billion. We saw that it wasn't true, and that when currently we are running out of IPv4 addresses. But can we say the same thing or different thing for IPv6? The size is always fixed, 128 bits. So maybe in 20 years we'll talk about people because it's not enough addresses. Is it possible? Or? So the problem is that it's very, very difficult to imagine what 2 power 128 means. So we have a lot of way to, to imagine what is this number. For example, we can say that if we put all the IPv4 addresses in a bucket, then the IPv6 address is the volume of the sun. So you see the difference of the sun. The address is four times longer, but each time you add a bit, you multiply by two the address size. So here you multiply by two power 96. So it's a very, very huge number. And if you look currently for IPv4, I don't have the number for Mexico, but in US, each US citizen has six IPv4 addresses. A European citizen has one address. A China, Chinese, has 0 0.1 address. An Indian has 0 0.1 address. I don't know about Africa, but, but it will be less. So it means that not all people can have IPv4 address. In IPv6, if you look at each user, each people on Earth, in, I think it's 2020, then each inhabitant will have six, uh, 60,000 billion, 300 trillion of addresses. So every people will have this number of them. It means that you, have, you may have a lot of mobile phone to reach that number. If you look at Earth, you have this kind of computation that gives you the number of addresses you can have by square meter. So it's a very, very long... Uh, uh, you can have a lot of addresses. So, normally, we will have no problem with this size. Because it's very, very huge. And in fact, we will see that we don't use all this number because we start wasting addresses. To ease 
the management of that. But we will see some number, and we will see that it's still very high value for over two. So that that was very funny to find an example that say that IPv6 are very very huge number. And you don't remember that if you put one address each centimeter, then you have a cyclone with a radius of plenty of uh, uh, light year uh, radius cycle or something like that. So I think that it's very important and some people misunderstood what we were talking about. And some people say, okay, if I have an IPv6 address uh, for, uh, for every uh, electron on Earth, for every atom on Earth, then I can give an IPv6 address to that chair. So I build a chair and I will give an IPv6 address. Or why the baby will be born, I will give him an IPv6 address for his time. So that's so stupid uh, thing. Because an address is only necessary when you are on the network. The address is not an identifier. The address is a way to locate you on the network. For example, you have your uh, driving license and you have a number in your driving license. And this number is unique. Like an address, it's unique. But if you give to the postman, you put your driving uh, license number in the mail and you give it to the postman and the postman has to locate you, it will be very, very complex. So the address is your place on the network, your location on the network. If you move, you change your address. If you are not connected to the network, you cannot have an address. So the address is not an identifier, it's a technical object that locates you on the network. So that's uh, 1994, but it means that we still have problems with this. It depends on the position of the network. So, as I say, if you move, I move from France to Mexico, I change my IPv6 address. But maybe if I stay in Mexico for 10 years, I will have to change my IP address because the network has to be reorganized on my provider will say, okay, now I see that if I allocate the address this way, I can I make more aggregation on my addressing plan. So you will have to change your address. And people does not like that. Big companies want to keep their address. So that's something that there is a fight between large companies that want to have fixed addresses and Network manager that may want to, like ASP, but may want from time to force people to remember to optimize the network. So currently, we don't have the tools to remember easily a network. So it means that we are going to have also provider independent addresses in IPv6, an address that will uh, last forever for your company. But this is actually the state of the art, but maybe in the uh, next year, three years, we will have some other way to, to manage the network. But if you are connected to Telmex, normally you will have a prefix, and that prefix will not change. Or if it changes, it will be every uh, five years, so you will have a big stability in the prefix. So that's normally what we expect. In France, it's what provider will offer. You will have a prefix, and that prefix will never change. In Belgium or Germany, in IPv4, providers are changing the prefix every day. Or the IPv4 address every day. So it's a way for the provider to avoid you to put server in your network. Because your address is changing. And if you want a fixed address, you have to pay more. And this provider wants to reproduce the same in IPv6, it means that your prefix will change a bit. So that you to accept. But from my point of view, it's totally stupid because you don't have only a big server with web, web content, but that the server can be a very small uh, piece of equipment. For example, it can be a temperature sensor. 
And so if you want to get information for the temperature sensor, you must know the setting. And if you change the prefix regularly, then more complex. But marketing division of this provider say, okay, we are going to reproduce what we are going to do, what we don't like to do. Okay, so just to to say that normally your address will be very stable in time, but maybe from time to time, not correctly the case, but maybe in the future when we have better tool, you will have to remember from time to time your network. But it will be during long period of time. Let's say for example provider, we say you have this traffic right now, but I will change it in two months or three months. So start remembering your network. So that's some possible things. Okay, so now we are going to, to see IPv6 addressing. So here we have different kind of addresses. So loopback address, you have the same thing in IPv4. You have a new kind of address we don't have in IPv4. It's local link local addresses. And it starts with AVAT. You have global addresses that are equal to what you have in uh, IP, IPv4 global addresses. They start by 2000 slash 3. What does it mean? If I write 2 in binary, I have 0, 0, 1, 0. I take the first three bits, so it starts by 0, 0, 1. So we will see how we manage this plan, this plan, and we have you have also multicast addresses, and now we have also an equivalent of private addresses in IPv4. So how we represent an address? We have seen that we use this representation, and we continue to use CIDR. So to us, what we have seen this morning about CIDR is exactly the same. It means that you have a prefix slash and you give a length. So here 48. So 48 means that you have three uh, worth of 15 bits. So 2,160, 3,003. Column columns means that the rest is equal to zero, and you have specified the 38 bits. So this, so this is a prefix you assign to a link or to a sign. And here. You have an address which is cut in the middle. The first 64 bits is a prefix that is used to, for routing packets. And the last 64 bits is something strange. It's a, like a random number. It's something that identifies your interface and that. So what does it mean? It means that here we are going to waste a lot of space. Because I have my Ethernet network, for example, and I will allocate to that internet network a slash 64. So the 64 last bits are for interface ID, interface identifier, and that thing. So I have two power 64 values. But I will have only, let's say, 50 equipment connected to the network. So here I will waste a lot of space just for my interface. So the goal here is to allow auto configuration. So it's what we saw this morning with IPX, when we have auto configuration, and when we, we move from IPX to IPv4. We lose auto configuration, and IPv6 tries in another way to use the same principle as IPv6. It means that here you have your prefix, your network number, and the last part is derived, in that example, from your mechanics. So you have to Of course, if you can remember the 64 first bits, it's impossible for you to remember the last. So this is the MAC address of your equipment. And if I ask what is the MAC address of your laptop, 
You use your laptop every day, but you don't know my address. They will not be able to memorize this. And what is quite new in IPv6 is that you you can have um, several address per interface. In IPv4 it's possible, but normally you don't do it. In IPv6 you will have generally two IPv6 addresses. One will be the link local address and the other one will be the global address. So we will manage several address per interface. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it creates problems, and we will see this kind of problem when we will study uh, multi -home. So, let's look at the space. So here is all the space where you have address allocation, so it's still managed by an app like I did before, so we continue to have the same principle and global address as we saw is 2000 slash 3 so it means that here we have 3 bits and we are using only one value of these 3 bits so it means that we are currently using only one eighth of the addressing space and most of the remaining space are unused it means that the future generation will be able to use this space to extend the network or to develop new addressing plans. So we are not blocking everything here, we just work in a very small space in the IPv6. Then you have link local addresses, FE80 slash 10, multicast, FF slash 8. And we have, in the zero part, we have also some special addresses that can be used. And for the rest, ah yes, you have also private addresses here, and the rest is not used. So, we, are, we have space to develop new things. So if you look at an address, here I have a global address, and here I have a local address, you find some similarities, it means that here you have 64 bits that are used for the interface ID. In the link local addresses, after the interface ID or before the interface ID, you add FE80 and plenty of zeros to have this length of 128 bits. In IPv4 in global addresses, sorry, you have the first bit 001, you find this plan. Then you have a global prefix of 45 bits. So it means that and this is given by your provider. So normally if you are a time and you want to ask for an IPv6 prefix, then your provider will give you a slash 48. So we will assign you 48 bits. And after that, you have 16 bits that will allow you to number your networks inside your company. Okay? So you see that the address is very simple. You will remember this part very easily. Be because the, fir the first 48 bits are given to your company. So you will see that every day. So every day you will see the same value. And after one week or two weeks, you will have that in mind. At the time, it's very easy to manage the network since you have a class B, so you have only one prefix. At Telecom Brotan, we have three class C prefixes. So we have to remember three class C prefixes for the addressing plan. Here in IPv6, we have only one value. So it's much easier to, to play with. Then you have the set ID, so here it's as a manager. You know what is your addressing plan, and you will see some tricks to, to give some value to see that. Interface ID, we saw an example just before, which derived from the MAC address. So it's one possibility, and you will see this on in global address. In global address, you can do it also, but for a server, it's not a good solution. 
because you don't know the MAC address of it. So since you don't know the MAC address, you cannot remember the IPv6 address. So you can also manually assign an interface ID. For example, column column 1 for the first server. Column column 2 for the second server. So this way you can remember easily the IPv6 address of the server. Because it will be the prefix of the company, it will be on a special network where you put the server, and it will be server 1, 2 or 3. And with the compact notation, you just put column column 1. So here you can, this kind of address can be easily remembered. But we are going to see in more details how we can assign a different ID in the future. So, let's go first to uh, global prefixes. And we can have some good information on a website called uh, CZXX. So, here. So I'm connecting to, to that website, and I'm going to this symbol, ghost root enter, that looks at all the IP prefixes we can find in, in the network. So we have some old prefixes that we don't use right now, which we start with a change value it was 3 FFSE, and it was used, used until the 666. So it was the. Uh, so the 6 bond was an experimental network that was used at the beginning to test IPv6 protocol. On the 6th June of 2006, this network has been dismantled, and now we are running pollution net, pollution net. So if you look at the number here, you see that you have right that have. Uh, allocated or see uh, this number of prefixes, so 3,511. Then you have US, ethnic, US and Canada, with 2,170. Then ethnic, then Latin America, and Africa. So if we continue on this page, we have all the prefix allocated to uh, providers. So I told you that normally your provider should give you the slash 48, but it means that the provider receives something shorter from its registry. And here you have the value. So you see that the, ma the large majority of prefixes given to provider are slash 32. But you have some the small value. For example, you have one slash 13, Department of Defense get this, uh, this value. Then you, you, we have 2 slash 19 that have been given to two providers. One is Deutsche Telekom and the other one is Cross Telecom. So, I would like to, to stop here and look more in details of, in the addressing plan of France Telecom if we imagine a slash 19 just to, to fix the value and see because it's very difficult to imagine numbers with this kind of thing. So if I receive a slash 19, it may not remember it starts by 001. So you have 16 bits. that are used to represent the provider. Okay? And zero, this gives you a slash. Like, then, a provider normally has to allocate you a slash 48. Okay? So it means that this provider has 29 bits to reach the slash 48. Okay? So, this means that this can be 2 power 29 customers. Okay? So, this is 
a very, very huge number of customers. And this customer can be a DSL customer that will receive a slash 48 for their home, 3G customer that can receive a slash 48 on their mobile phone. It can be also a company's uh, business uh, connection, etc. It means that you can put a lot of companies. Now, at your home, you receive a slash 48. It means that you have 16 bits to number your sub-network in your home. So in your home, you can have up to 65,000 sub-network in your home. Of course, it's a large number. Even at ITAM, if ITAM receives a slash 48, it's a large number. And then on each network, you have your interface ID with a length of 64. So you see that here we have no limit. In your home, in the company, 65,000 network is a lot. And 2 power 29 is also a large number. So the question is, can we have enough provider of that? So here, same thing. We can have 65,000 providers. How many countries we have? Okay, 200. It depends if you go to the FIFA website, I think it's more than 200. <laughs> but in, in uh, UN, it's less than 20. So it means that in each of the countries, you can have 300. Provider the size of Profound Telecom. Okay? So each of these providers, in each country, you can have 300 providers that can allocate prefixes to 2 power 29 customers. Okay? So we have space. Okay? Don't worry about space, we have enough. So some people, Say, okay, giving 65,000 prefixes to a home customer is too much. So some customer, for example, will say we are going to allocate you a slash 60. Since you have a slash 64 for your prefix, it means that you can have 16 network in your network, in your home, which is quite a large number. You may have also a slash uh, 56, and if you have a slash 56, it means that you have 8 bits and so 255 sub network in home, which is also a good number. So some people, some provider will give you larger prefix because maybe they receive a slash 32 from their registry. So if they have a slash 32, it means that they can have only 65,000 customers if they allocate a slash 48 to each customer. So in, if you are running, for example, in France, the Renater network, so the, the National Research and Education Network, has received a slash 32. But we don't have 65,000 university of research center in France. So that good and each university of research center can have a special field. And the opposite, if you look at a DSL provider that receives a slash 48, if he has only 65,000 customers, then he's not a good provider. So he will have more than this number of customers. So one solution is to extend his prefix and, for example, allocate slash 50, uh, 56 to the customer. So here we have the number, so as I told you, the vast majority is slash 32. And here we have the top uh, 200 of all the countries are listed. So uh, of people of connectivity to IPv6. So if you look, France is 
The first one is New uh, USA. So it doesn't mean, if you look at uh, how things are classified, it's the visible prefixes you have on the network. So, uh, Mexico, 36 prefixes are visible from the network. So we can have a look to these prefixes. So, here when you see a prefix in white, it means that it's okay. Every BGP router where we make measurement have seen the prefix. If you see it uh, in red, it means that during 24 hours, the prefix has not been seen. And the yellow color gives you how many equipment has received the prefix. So for example, Unam prefix is not seen as not be seen by all the BGP router that makes the region. But it's uh, less than it's between 80 and uh, 100%. Then you have all these prefixes that are seen on the uh, internet, so are present in BGP routing table. The other one in red are located, but are not announced by you see that, so I say, I told you that this boundary slash 48 is not so fixed because you can reduce the SID part to if you are in a home environment. But in, a, for example, at ITA, you will have the slash 48. So now how you can divide it, how you can number this value. There is no rules. It's up to you. Because this part is the numerization plan of your company. So you can do stupid things like one, two, three, four. So each time you create a subnetwork, you do plus one on your network. Another solution is, for example, it's something you have done at Telecom Broadband, is to reuse the VLAN number. Because remember this morning we saw that a VLAN is behind the router and we have to uh, give a prefix, a specific prefix to the VLAN. So one good trick is to reuse VLAN number. That way you don't have to remember two different numbers. One for IPv6 prefixes and one for VLAN. So that's a possibility and something that is more tricky is to use the first nibble the first value in your subnet ID, remember, subnet ID is four values. To have a slash 16, or to have 16 bits. So you use this first nibble to define a community of users. For example, in a university, you can have zero for infrastructure, so to number routers, etc. etc. You can have a value for your Wi-Fi guest, a value for the employee, and a value for the study. So this way, it's quite easy to filter things. For example, if you want to avoid students to go to uh, an discussion part of the network, then you just have to put uh, access, to, uh, access list that blocks E to go to A. So this way, administratively, you can create community of users. And then it remains 12 bits, and in these 12 bits you can create entity and some network if you want. For example, Riondo here and some type, another value for Santa Teresa or things like this. Or you can, if since you have 12 bits here, you can also put a VLAN number if you want. So this way you can manage easily the network to have some technical routing part here, and some administrative filtering here. So this is one, uh, one possibility. So, this was for the subnet ID. 